when I was really little, my dad was a postman um, and my mum uh, was actually a, a GP, a general practitioner in, in an area called Hare Hills. Um, both my mum and dad had came from working class backgrounds. They were the first generation of their families to be able to go to university thanks to the Labour government that came in after the Second World War. So um, unlike my grandma and granddad, who both left school at 13 and worked, my granddad um, worked in a factory, my mum's dad worked in a factory, my dad's dad was a lorry driver. Um, my mum and dad had the opportunity to have an education um, and both of them eventually just um, sort of kind of contributed back to the communities that they'd kind of been part of. So my mum worked in a really poor area of Leeds. My dad ended up being a teacher. Um, really strong sense of social obligation that they had. And that has shaped me. So I went to a comprehensive school in Leeds, went to university um, to, do my, uh, to do a degree in English and French, and then eventually did a PhD and then got a job at University of Manchester. My mum's dad um, had been a Labour councillor. He, his interest in politics, I think, stemmed from his experience during the Second World War. So he, he was from a, a really huge family. He had nine siblings and very, very poor. His parents were, Ill, were illiterate. And during the Second World War, he worked on a ship called the HMS Minna, which transported agents off the coast of um, between Shetland and Norway and in the Mediterranean. So he saved people from the Gestapo. He picked up spies. He did all sorts of really amazing stuff on this ship. He'd never seen the sea um, before he was 21 either, which was uh, amazing because he was, you know, he was just somebody who worked in a factory. And when, when he was on that, uh, during the war, he realised that the big difference between him and the officers was education. Um, and so he, he, he came back and he was educated um, by the Workers' Education Association. He had this massive interest in education and he became very politically engaged. So one of the things he was proudest of was building uh, council housing on the the sort of slum housing that he'd grown up in. And again, he, he believed that um, politics was about a kind of obligation to people in a community, that what mattered was enabling people to have opportunities to, you know, to live well and decently. And he never wanted, he never wanted to be rich and he never wanted to accumulate things. He, he lived in his council house pretty much all his life but he loved reading and he loved learning and he liked people. And he was, you know, he was, he, he was absolutely formative for me, basically. He's, the, he's one of the reasons why I was always interested in politics and always interested in the labour movement because it was about enabling ordinary people to, you know, to, to enjoy being alive, to enjoy um, what, you know, the kinds of opportunities that life, you know, that, that we can provide people with, that was, that was the reason, yeah. People. I, I, I really like people. I, I, I mean, genuinely I do. I, I just, um, and I don't believe that people are self-seeking or, or, or only in it for themselves. My experience of most people is that most people care about each other and most people want to help each other and most people get a lot out of helping each other and working together. And I think politics at its best is about that. You know, I think we've got a really short time on earth and that we owe it to each other for that short time we have on earth to be as good as it possibly can be. And all the things that we can control and manage we ought to try and control and manage and, 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 and work out so that people can lead the best lives that um, you know that, that we're able to lead because we can we can't do anything about accidents or falling out of love with people or being ill but all the other stuff I think we ought to do something about
People who work hard are often not paid the most. N nurses work really hard, they're not paid the most. Teachers work really hard and they're not paid the most. People who are care assistants work hard and they're not paid the most. I think there are lots of people who don't work that hard and are paid the most. So what do we think working hard is and what do we think matters? You know, and I, I'm the, I'm the mum of a disabled um, son who will probably never get full-time employment but I still think he absolutely deserves to have a decent life and opportunities and to be valued and not to struggle. I don't think people should be punished either for not being, you know, the, the person who has the, the highest academic success or kind of ends up, you know, with the, with the top job. But, you know, there's also other kinds of things that matter. I think, you know, I don't believe that people should all be played exactly the same. Uh, you know, because there are jobs with different degrees of responsibility. Um, but do I think that everybody deserves to have enough to have and to do the things that they want to do, that people deserve not to struggle? Yeah, I, I really believe that we ought to um, live in a society where, where nobody struggles to feed themselves and nobody struggles to pay their rent and nobody faces homelessness. And at the moment, people who work really hard, people like nurses, struggle to feed their children and are using food banks. And, and you know, that's for me completely wrong and will always be wrong. Well, the, the problem with the profit motive in, in relationship to health is that, is that it just can't work. There are some things which, you know, you, you introduce profiteering into and they're always going to be to the disadvantage of people. Um, I mean, you say people are, are living longer today, actually. Life expectancy is, is stalling in this country, which says a lot about what's happened over the last 10 years. But the fact that people are living longer um, and that that's used as a, as, as a way of saying something about the NHS is really more about a failure to properly resource social care, actually. Um, but my great granddad died in the 1930s before the formation of the NHS of a stomach ulcer. And he died because he couldn't afford health care. And in the United States, where health care is privatised, African-American women often have maternal mortality rates that are the same as countries like Sierra Leone. So the issue is really when we think about the NHS is what do we think matters? Do we, do we care about people? Do we recognise that being ill or unwell isn't anybody's fault? Do we want to penalise somebody for being ill or un unwell because they're also poor, ill and unwell? Or do we think that it's a fundamental obligation of any country or any government to ensure that its citizens uh, have access to good quality healthcare at the point of need? And, and, and for me, that's, a, that's a, just a fundamental kind of human, human right that we have to protect and preserve. Uh, well, I, sp I spent my career working in higher education, so I spent my career doing research and teaching students, and I think that actually t t teaching is a really good, ex it, is, is a, it bring gives you a lot of experience that, that's important in terms of talking to people, um, caring about people, knowing what it means to, um, you know, kind of com communicating as well, um, often you know, I think more and more I've, I've seen sort of students struggle with mental health difficulties and actually that's been a really eye-opening um, to me and, and you realise the impact of, 
you know, kind of things that are going on in, in society, on people, and, I, I, and you see it. And I think um, that that's a kind of driver for me in terms of politics. But my other experience I think is really important in that uh, if you are the parent of a disabled child, whether you like it or not, you have to, you, you learn how to fight because, because support and services are poor really in the sense that they're not properly resort, resort, um, sort of resourced, that there's not enough um, money to support people adequately, that there's a lot of uh, sort of discrimination. You always feel that you have to fight for every, every little thing and you get good at it. And I think learning to fight for things for my son um, has perhaps been the most kind of eye-opening eye experience and important experience for me. Um, you just have, you learn how to keep going, to not give up, to pick your battles, to talk to people, <laughs> to try the various ways in which you can to, to get the thing that you need. Um, you know, and, and while sometimes it's really dispiriting that that happens, you know, by the, at the, by the same token, I think it's given me a set of skills that means I, I, I don't give up. Yeah, of course my priority is to um, support places like Ratcliffe to be the kinds of places that they need to be today. I think it's, you know, when people talk about this, all of this stuff, I think we have to put it in the context of austerity as well. You know, there, there, are, longer, there, are, there are longer lasting issues around what happened to um, industrial towns when factories closed and the kinds of... Um, what wasn't put in place to support people. But there are also um, really important issues around cuts to local government funding. £97 million was cut from Berry Council and, and councils are becoming um, organisations that are ma you know, kind of managing on shoestrings. And if you've got very little money, it's very difficult to, 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 to give towns and places the attention that they need. And so, for instance, in terms of Ratcliffe, you know, I, I, you know, of course I'd want to see a school there because I think a school is important not just for the young people there, but for the town itself in terms of bringing people into the town and keeping people into the town. But I think you need more than a school. I think you need also um, places for young people to go. So I think one of the issues, and when you go walk around Ratcliffe at night, you can see this, there's nowhere for young people to go. And if you had something like a youth zone, I think that would make a huge difference. So a space where young people could go and do different things and learn different skills and, you know, say play sport or, you know, or, 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 or do dancing or boxing or whatever, a kind of place for young people to hang out is massively important as well. Leisure facilities that work for the town too. So, I, you know, I, th I think, um, you know, I think people in Ratcliffe are right to feel disenchanted and dispirited, um, you know, because I think a, a, lot of, a lot of people feel that way. Um, and I think it's, you know, for me, it would be one of my priorities to really, you know, to really work with people there to ensure that they had the, the infrastructure and the, you know, and, 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 and the spaces that they need. Yeah. I, I live in Presswich. Um, I love living in Presswich. Um, uh, I love Presswich Clough. Um, I, I, I think it's so um, amazing to have that kind of place on, you know, just literally on my doorstep, uh, so somewhere to sort of go for a walk. I think it's it's brilliant. I really like um, Ratcliffe Market. You know, now it's been regenerated. I think it's a it's it's a it's a great place to go. Um, I think all the parks here are an amazing resource. We've got some great parks. Um, and, and green spaces that I'd want to preserve. And I think they're a great 
new places, you know, kind of bars and restaurants and things kind of um, here too. So I think, I mean, there's loads of places I like. I mean, I'm not going to say I've not seen it and I, I'm not going to sort of weaponize it either. I mean, for me, it's just wrong. Absolutely. You know, so I'm not going, you know, anti-Semitism, anti-Semitism is wrong wherever and whenever it occurs. Um, it's, it's, I have seen anti-Semitism. I think you only have to look on social media to see anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the point is that what we have to do is to, be absolutely upfront and acknowledge acknowledge it wherever we see it. To be um, to have really robust and effective ways of tackling it, and to listen to the Jewish community. I think it's it's hugely important that we listen to what people are saying, take people's fears seriously, and work really really hard to rebuild trust. Um, I have never been afraid to call out anything that I think is inappropriate, where, wherever it is and whoever it comes from. I, th I think that that's an obligation and that as an obligation for me is tied to being in the Labour Party. I joined the Labour Party because I believe in equality, social justice, uh, fairness, decency. Um, you, you know, those for me are core values. I think it's a matter of huge um, you know, sadness for me and sorrow that this has become an issue, and I just think we've got to we've got to you know face it and work as hard as we possibly can to make sure you know it's combated both in the Labour Party and outside of the Labour Party. And you know, this isn't about numbers. Any any anti-Semitism is too much, and and that's my position. Do I do I think it's more um, more useful to be an MP when your party's in power? Well, yeah, yes. In, do I think it's do I think it's important? Yes, for me. Obviously, I want a Labour government because obviously I want our our, so our, our public services to be funded. Obviously, I want our NHS to be funded. Obviously, I want a party that's absolutely committed to climate change to be in power, to, to tackling climate change to be in power. Um, you know, I, I absolutely fear for our future in a, in a much more fundamental way if a Labour Party isn't in government, because we've got 11 years to tackle the climate emergency, and then it becomes irreparable. So if we have a Tory government a Tory government that has planted fewer trees than any other government, you know, in, in, in the last year, who has cut funding to the Environment Agency, who's cut funding to, to, to sort of um, Natural England, a, a, a party that isn't serious about, you know, alternative forms of energy. So, so do I think it's important that I would be an MP with the Labour government behind me? Yes, I do, because, um, because I really care about people and I really want to see um, an end to the, the suffering that people have been experiencing over the last 10 years. But would I work tirelessly for this community if we didn't have a Labour government and I was elected, yes, of course I would. I would do absolutely everything I could in my power to make sure people didn't suffer and that we, we found ways at a community level of supporting each other. Um, you know, that, that, that's why I'm doing it. I'm doing it not because I'm interested in the status of being an MP. I'm doing it because I look around and you, you only have to walk out of the door to see what 10 years of austerity has done. You only have to walk past homeless people to see it. And of course, whether or not we had a Labour Party or not, if I was the MP, I would want to
do something about that. But I'm not going to say that it's better or easier not, you know, <laughs> you know, for there not to be like a Labour government. I want there to be a Labour government because I think without one, um, we won't have any public services and we won't really have a society with a fo you know, that, that functions properly for people. You know, when you talk about a decline, and I think I, I, I wouldn't use that word because I think it's, you know, I, I think it's too big a word. I think that there are amazing examples here of people working together. I was at a community centre in Ratcliffe the other day, and the community had got together and they were running a food bank and a furniture bank and a clothes bank. They were growing vegetables, they were repairing bikes, they were recycling. All of that is an example of something amazing about people in Bury South, people in Ratcliffe. Like something you should be so proud of. But actually, does it fill me with sorrow that people can't feed each other and can't feed themselves? That they don't have the money to buy clothes for their children? that they don't have the money to buy, you know, bikes for their kids, that everything is being, um, you know, that people are just about managing because people in communities are coming together. I think, you know, that, you know, that says everything. And, you know, the impact of cuts is huge. The impact of government cuts is, is, is absolutely massive. And, and it's such, I mean, for me, it, it's, it's such a false economy. So if you cut community policing or frontline policing, then your streets aren't as safe and then people feel more frightened and, and then, you know, you, young people might get into trouble before somebody can pick up on it or somebody who knows them can pick up on it. If you cut youth services, again, you've got a set of knock-on effects. If you cut social care to the bone, people are then more isolated, more likely to become ill people then end up on hospital trolleys or in hospital beds when they could be in their homes. The point about the impact of, of the cuts on Bury sales is that lot, you know, cuts in different areas have huge knock-on effects on, 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 on other areas and you know, make everything, everything more difficult and everything more strained and put pressure, you know, sort of increasing pressure. And, and, and that's, um, you know, you, when we think about what's happened, you know, I think, yes, cuts have had a huge bearing on people's lives here. And, you know, and I know that as a mum because they've had a huge bearing on my son's life. So you have been at work and you get a diagnosis of cancer and you can't work and you're put through a humiliating and degrading assessment. Can you work harder if you have had your benefits stopped or sanctioned because you've not been able to turn up to an interview? and you are terminally ill or you have a really significant illness, can you work harder? How do you work harder if that's who you are? You know, I, I admire a lot of the women who are involved in the, in the kind of um, peace process in, in Ireland. Um, you know, Bernadette Devlin and people like that, I, I admire. People who, who were really part of a, intervening in a really kind of male um, domain. I admire, um, you know, I admire people like Barbara Castle. Um, you know, I think, and, and women who were involved in the labour movement sort of early on, people who were doing it when women weren't supposed to be doing it. 
Um, I, I, you know, I admire a lot of people who are involved in sort of new social movements when they're emerging. Um, my friend Debbie Jolly, who was one of the people who set up Disabled People Against the Cuts and who died. Um, very suddenly and, and who worked really tirelessly really to, to challenge what the government was doing to disabled people, taking away people's independence, putting people in a position that they'd fought so hard to change. You know, disabled people in this country only, only gained civil rights in 1994. So in terms of a civil rights struggle, in terms of recognition, it's really recent. And people had just gained the right to independent life, not to be institutionalised. And then this government comes along and punishes people for being disabled. And, you know, so people like Debbie, I, I, I massively admire. combination of issues right there are lots of things that you know um, obstacles for instance in relationship to the school in Ratcliffe how the Department of Education um, works out how you get a school in an area you know in other words they use figures that are borough wide they don't look at towns so there are there's guidance and structures that are coming from government that make it difficult and that are obstacles. Um, I think, you know, people have really, really struggled and fought to get a school. So I don't think, you know, so I think there are um, obstacles that are occurring at a national level. There are obstacles about, you know, kind of how you get capital funding for a school, because you can want a school, but you've got to build a school. So you have to have the money to build a school. So how do you get that money if central government have got particular kinds of uh, restrictions and guidelines on what on the kinds of things that you need in order to get a new school? In other words, people, you know, how many, you know, demographic information, data. You know, so I, I, I think there's an issue about government and how um, funding is allocated. And there's an issue about how you push and fight for that as well. So I think there are, there are, there are you know, it's, it's not, I'm, I'm not about to lay blame on any individual because I don't think that's appropriate. But I would say, and would want to be an MP that fought and fought and fought and will fight to achieve things. And I would say one of my qualities, or at least one of the things I've learned, is never to give up and never to stop. I mean, maybe that's something we could talk about because I think the interesting thing is once you be, it's, of course you don't, you're just a person. But a lot of the time people don't see you as a person either. Um, you just, uh, most, you know, all the people I've met are just people who want to do their best and often people who want to do their best for their community. And, um, and yet as a woman particularly, you can get loads of abuse for just wanting to do something positive for people in the community. And I think that's, 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 what, that's, that's a pity and I sort of understand why that happens, but yeah, I wish it didn't. Well, I think 
it's probably one of the most destructive things that's ever happened in the sense that it has divided people. People are really angry about it. It's been, you know, it hasn't, I, th I think it hasn't, it hasn't helped us. And I think, you know, and the thing that really frustrates me is the Conservatives repeating that they're going to get Brexit done when they haven't got Brexit done, when they've had opportunities to get Brexit done. Um, Boris Johnson could have voted for Theresa May's deal, he didn't. Um, it's shown them, I think, it's shown the government to be incompetent and to be liars, to be honest. And I'm really, really worried that the, the conservative deal that they're talking about will just be utterly devastating. And it'll be devastating because it will involve um, carving up uh, elements of the health service. It'll involve getting, <coughs> you know, US-based pharmaceutical companies involved in, um, you know, uh, you know, the, the uh, kind of the, the medications we currently get on the NHS and the, that the NHS oversee. And so I'm really worried about the kind of consequences of a Boris Johnson deal. And I think if we rush into that, because they're telling us that that is what it means to get Brexit done, it will have a disastrous set of consequences for this country. I also think it's untrue. And Brexit won't be done in the way that um, we're being told it will, because it will take, you know, years to actually establish the trade relations and a trade deal. So what do you do when you've got a divided country and you've got an issue which none of us realised was as complicated as it was? You know, when I think when, when we initially voted, none of us really had thought about the backstop or the implications for Ireland and so on. So what do you do? And, and I think that the Labour position on this is the right position. It's the only position. It's a position that at least um, enables people to have a say in what happens next. So I, I, I think, you know, the idea of a referendum, you know, having had a, in which we are able to see the deal that we're being offered or have the option to remain is the only democratic way forward. The only way in which we might be able to resolve this without intensifying the, 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 the divisions that have occurred and without putting the NHS at risk. So that's my position on, on Brexit. Everybody's got to realise that you know, people have held different positions. And, you know, when, when I don't want to be in a country that's divided where people are shouting at each other or calling each other traitors or using that kind of language. I, that's not the Britain that I believe in. I, you know, I think one of our greatest characteristics is tolerance and getting on with stuff and getting on with each other and having a sense of humour. All of that's gone. And, you know, we've, 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 we've got to acknowledge that it's a difficult issue and we've got to acknowledge that to resolve that you need, you know, you, you need a way through that respects everybody. And, and I, you know, would always hope that I was somebody who, who, who does respect everybody and respects that there are different views. I suppose my position on this is I'd like to see uh, fans take ownership of the club. I'd like to see something similar to what happened at FC United, which I just think um, you know, is 
you know, it's been a really important community-based venture. Um, you know, I Berry, Berry, Berry FC was so important. They were really important for my son as well because they did they did lots of activities for young disabled people. You know, they were really embedded in a community. Um, I think football's massively important. My granddad played for Earthling Borough Diamonds and then managed them. So I, I think sort of footballing communities, lower league footballs, you know, I mean, not that Bury were lower league in the way that Earthling Borough Diamonds were, but uh, <laughs> football is just massively important. It's hugely important. But I, you know, I think that money is, to some extent, ruined it. And uh, for me, what's important is that um, the fans who care about the club and the community that cares about the club um, ought to be the, the driving force in the future of that club. So, um, you know, I would like it to be a kind of community asset, actually, driven by the people who've got, who care about it the most and have got the most invested in it. And you know, I'd like to see it rise from the ashes and thrive, basically, because it's just so important. Well, it's got massive potential, hasn't it? And it's got, there are things that are already happening that I think we should be really proud of. Like, I, you know, I think about sort of Presswich Arts Festival and a lot of the things that are emerging out of communities. But I'd like to see um, massive regeneration in Ratcliffe. I think Ratcliffe's, a, you know, it has huge potential. I think it needs um, the kind of investment that the Labour Party are actually offering communities. So one of the things that Labour Party are offering is, is, is kind of regional transformation funds um, to really rebalance the North-South um, divide, to really make sure that towns that have kind of left been left behind sort of post sort of industrial decline, that they get the money they need to regenerate and Part of that is, um, you know, put, putting money into a, a new green economy where people learn the skills they need, um, you know, for instance, to make environmentally friendly, sustainable housing and um, for that housing to be made in factories prefabricated so that we don't have to rely on the weather because we know in Bury South the weather's often really um, less than um, less than less than welcoming to outside work so so all of those so you know I, I'd like to see us benefit from the investment and the funding that a Labour government will 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 put into the north in order to you know build our environmentally friendly sustainable social housing in order to be able to have our, our, you know our youth zone in Ratcliffe um, in order to be able to make the most of the people here, because I think people are the greatest asset ever, and I think people here in Bury South are fantastic. So, um, so yeah, I'd like to see us develop. I'd like to see places like Ratcliffe um, get revitalised, um, you know, and I'd like to also sort of, you know, invest in our green spaces and the kinds of opportunities that we might have there as well.